So that's on now. Okay. So um, this um, webinar is going to feature uh, two people who are, for whom I've got an enormous amount of respect, Dale Anderson, whom you all know, um, because she's been involved with this program since the beginning. Was it 15 years since you... Oh, probably, yes. The first time, I don't know, Michael, when did you start? I think it was about 2005. Years. Oh, could well be. I'm not, I think I missed the first year when, um, but then maybe after that I'm, I've been involved, yeah. Yes, but certainly uh, with Bridget for the last 10 years, and you, I think we did 2010 was the first one we all did together, was it? I can't remember. But been a, I think it been was a, been a long time. 29, yeah. Mm. 2009B. Okay, good. All right. A long time. <laughs> and um, so you don't really need any introduction apart from to say what a wonderful person you are. You're a, you're a wonderful um, educator and you work at Victoria University. Mm. And the what's the status with the Maori name now? Have they made up their mind whether they're going to chuck out well, the Victoria we, University? Well, we're Tehiranga Waka, which is quite a nice name, really. So mm -hmm. that seems to come first, and then Victoria University of Wellington. <laughs> and <Good. big> <laughs> of Wellington, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. And so Wellington. you're going to be talking about um, some of your research and other people's research about, um, what, the power of talk? In, yeah. Mm, um, yeah. In um, ambitious teaching in science, really. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, Dai's going to pick up the ambitious science teaching, but talk is a very big part of that. So we thought maybe I'll go first. I think all of you, just to look at you, thank you, are uh, pretty brave, most of you. Hang <laughs> on. So can, can, in... I, can I just say a little bit about Dai? Yeah, sure. Okay. So Dai, um, Dai is an alumnus of the um, SGLP program. And she is a distinguished science teacher because she won the Prime Minister Science Teachers um, Award in 2016. She teaches in um, Hutt Valley and um, her um, presentation is entitled Let's Be Ambitious. And she draws on um, some of the work that she's done with her students and also work that she did when she was on a Fulbright award in the States and I'm interested in hearing about her experience and her wisdom and she shares the um, experience, Fulbright experience with um, my son Paul that we were talking about who, who also went on a Fulbright and uh, when Paul was on his Fulbright was at the time of the last American election and um, Josephine and I were over there on the actual day of the election. And it was a very strange experience, I must admit. <laughs> anyway, Di, you're going to kick off. No, Sorry. Dale, Sorry. Dale, no, 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 it was Dale, wasn't it, it was going to kick off. Sorry. That's fine. Thank you. Um, nice to see so many of that I've already seen for most of the day. So thank you very much for giving up your evening to um, listen to me ramble on yet again. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to share screen with you. So we'll get on and do that, and I will start the slideshow from the beginning. Right. So yes, I think um, when this um, webinar was muted, we kind of thought it would be really nice to highlight this idea of focusing on talk and ambitious science teaching. I think um, if we're really going to change our practices and improve the quality of science teaching and learning in New Zealand classrooms, this is one of the areas probably that we really need to think of a lot. And I am going to recap on some of the things that we've talked about in, in the um, STLP workshop days and um, a little bit, but also just um, talk a, a little bit more about some of the things that I've seen and that um, some other researchers are seeing. So there'll be a little bit of a recap and a little bit of a reminder and then just um, some ideas. So a quick overview, um, a, re a quick recap on the nature of productive classroom talk um, and a revisit of the kind of talk um, that impacts on student achievement from the work that's been done at, um, by Sarah Hennessy and her and Christine out at um, Cambridge University. 
and then just think about some talk formats and how we manage talk and then I'd like to spend just uh, present you with a few frameworks and a few ideas for um, looking at our own classroom talk as a means of um, improving our practice and just actually seeing what's going on because I think sometimes we we think we're doing things when often we're not and there's nothing like a bit of um, serious data to actually give us some meat to um, chew on and reflect on when we're considering our own practice. So um, the big question is does all talk help learning and um, I wonder what you think about that. I'm just going to show you a slide that Bridget actually um, went to ULEARN in 2018 and heard Janet um, Clinton Hattie talking there about the Visible Classroom project. So just, I'm not sure how many of you have seen this before, but just have a quick look at this data from 10 different classrooms. Look at the words per minute, which is quite a lot. And the percentage teacher talk time. And then there's some things about was the language what was the language level responsive to where the kids are at? Two is yes, one is no. <laughs> Sometimes they're just repeating what the students said, and this, there can be reasons for that. There could be reasons to, to make what students say um, heard by the whole class, not just by what the, by one person. Um, yeah. But I think I've, looking at that, it looks like who's doing the talking in the classroom and often who's doing the talking is the same person who's doing the thinking. So um, it's just a little bit of food for thought, really. And I guess one of, the, one of the things we can think about is how much do we talk and how much do our children talk? And then the biggest question is who's doing the thinking because whoever's doing the thinking is the person who's really doing the hard lifting of the talk and the, the learning. So um, another really useful um, article is this one by Michaels and O'Connor. Now I think some of you who've done um, some of the maths talk moves and things might be familiar with Chapman and O'Connor, an article by them that talk about the talk moves that we use in maths. I think this is the same person, Kathy O'Connor. But they've done some work on um, talking in science classrooms and I just thought these things are just quite useful for us to quickly review again the kind of talk that is productive so everybody can hear and join in. Um, it's focused and it's rigorous, so it's not just wandering any old place and not, not just any old idea. And I think this is probably the most important one and we'll see why in a, in a minute when we look some, at some more of the evidence about how talk helps learning. Students are actually motivated to participate. Um, they want to go public with their ideas and have a stake in the conversation. So actually that's one of the most critical things is actually getting student participation and making it so that everyone has a right and responsibility to contribute. Those of you who do um, a lot of um, some of the maths that we that is sort of quite common now might be quite familiar with some of these ideas, but it's about us creating classrooms where talk is okay and where kids feel safe to participate and welcome, you know, welcome to that they, um, they feel that, that it's absolutely fine and expected that they participate and are happy to do so. But I think also as teachers, we're responsible for actually helping students to practice those new ways of talking and working together. So we have to think about how we can do that too. And so in terms of some of the things that is, as teachers for us that we need to be able to, is, is actually believing that students can do this kind of talk. That's the absolutely the first thing. Helping to establish those kind of classroom norms and, and rules for talk so that everybody feels they can join in. Um, that there's purpose for our talk. So it's not just talk for the sake of it, but actually it's a planned act of teaching or at least a deliberate act of teaching. I, I don't think that it's always planned, but it, it, we, we should plan for talk as well. But that even when we do incidental talk, that there's a, a definite purpose for that. 
well-framed guiding questions and I think that relates to the purpose that we want. What, what are we thinking about that we want to do? Are we developing some kind of conceptual idea in science or are we helping to make some aspect of the nature of science explicit? Are we helping them to think about how what a particular capability looks like? So being very clear about that purpose is, is critical and it's, it's a bit the same as we know when we're doing practical work in science with students that actually having a, a, a very um, specific focus and purpose for that practical work is also really important and when teachers have that and they make that explicit and they really follow it through with the way they question that um, that accomplishes some really strong learning too. So I think it's something Bridget and I always have thought about that purpose is really important so and the questions that relate to that. Having some structures and formats help and um, I think we've talked a lot in, in our DCLP workshops about the kinds of talk moves that help. So those things are really important. Um, I've talked briefly about this, I think, and in, in, um, um, so if you've been in the programme since 2017, and I think most of you are actually in the current programme, we talked about this in workshop three, about the kind of talk that makes a difference to student achievement in this work that's come out of Cambridge, University of Cambridge where they found some really, for, through a rather large um, quantitative study and in, look into a lot of classrooms, that talk actually does make a difference to student outcomes and that the important things are this high levels of elaboration and querying that boost academic performance and high levels of elaboration that actually also boost attitudes. Um, and that because it's not too much to think about, that actually it should be easy for us to focus on in PD in terms of, well, how can we get these specific types of talk going? So, yeah, that elaboration and querying um, boosts performance as long as students participate. So getting the students talking is what's absolutely critical. Um, so just having a quick look through this elaboration, just a quick reminder of what we um, have covered already. That's where students are, are building on or elaborating, clarifying ideas, um, clarifying what somebody else has said, um, just expanding on a particular aspect, that kind of thing. And querying is where they're kind of challenging something. Um, so they've understood what it is and then thinking that actually it might not be that. So to me that speaks about actually really understanding a particular thing and, and clarifying for themselves and expanding on what it actually means. But I do want to point out that these things only actually improved um, academic achievement when the, the, the students were participating. And that means not just not answering a teacher's question, but where they actually were talking student to student. And I was just thinking, it took me back to um, this a couple of weeks ago when I was in a student teacher's classroom, where exactly that kind of thing was happening. And I thought, this is actually, you don't actually see that a lot as managed by a student teacher, where the students are actually discussing with each other. And I started to think about what was going on here. And, and there was a, there was a, it was quite a natural part of the classroom students didn't have to put their hands up to be a part of the conversation. It was okay for them to respond. The desks were sorted so that all of the students could see each other. That was just the natural way that the classroom was. And if you think about that, that kind of um, allows people to see when someone is finishing their conversation and when it's okay to join in and when it's okay to talk next. They can, they, if, you can, if, if you're sitting in rows and all you can see is the back of somebody's head, then it's really hard to join in. So I think those kind of things are probably quite important for us to think about. How do we make sure that even the physical setting of our classroom works? And then the classroom norms were okay and those rules of talk had been established that kids knew how to join a conversation, how to add on to another student's conversation. And I've put there so that the conversation actually was much more like netball. The ideas passed around from student to student and they didn't all have to go through the teacher. So I think, um, and that participation is absolutely critical because when that participation is low, those whole benefits for elaboration and querying are not present. So it's actually quite important that we, 
we think about how to make that kind of talk okay. Um, yeah, so some of the things that can help us um, support talk, uh, um, these sort of what I'd call teaching formats, but um, I was in another, in fact, Bridget and I were both in a meeting on Monday where we had um, a, quite a young teacher, who's, um, I think he'd been three years in the classroom, and he, he, um, he was saying that he, he'd, um, he'd organised for the class to do a continuum and for kids to justify their position on this continuum. And he was so surprised that the talk went on for 20 to 25 minutes and that was very animated and the students were really willing to join in. And he'd said he, you know, he was really surprised that he should have allowed much more time for that talk. And I think sometimes we just forget to plan time for talk. So I think that's probably the first important thing. Let's just make room for it. Um, there's all these different formats. I, I, you know what these formats are. But I think some of the things that we forget to do sometimes, like teacher-guided discussion can be really crucial. And that's those times when we can ask those questions and drop in and pop in a question to keep it going or to, to help the student to clarify. But I often think of the times when I've run pl practical stuff with my class and what is it that goes when you finish the practical? Suddenly it's gone on longer than you've thought. You're madly trying to tidy up and get the kids to get everything away and all of a sudden it's 10 to 3 and the bell is going to go and it's time for them to leave. And it's the talk that um, gets left off or that reflective discussion after you've finished doing your practical work that actually gets lost. So making time is useful. Making time and planning your groups and things like that for when things are going to happen. I was, I've included this idea of the continuum, which was actually a really rich opportunity for students to, um, to really start to use evidence across a whole range of lessons. Um, this teacher had been doing a whole unit on could we live on Mars? And so he presented them with a, a range and a whole range of opportunities where they could consider some of the evidence about how we know what the conditions are like on Mars and what the conditions are and how we know. And then he said to them, okay, look, we've spent, we've spent you know, three or four weeks doing this topic now, took them through some of the evidence that they'd had. And he said, I want you to think about, you know, when you first started this out, you thought, you, you wrote down a statement, could I live on Mars? Now I want you to review that. And then I want you to stand in this place and then be able to defend it. And he said that the discussion that that generated and their, their ability to draw on what they'd seen was, was really good. So making those kind of things. There's all those time to talk kind of things where um, kids can talk, you know, you can get kids to talk to each other for 30 seconds and the other person talks. Helping them to just have these opportunities. And you all know this, but it's just thinking through some of them again, I think. Expert jigsaws where they've had different inputs of, of of maybe they've generated different pieces of evidence and they have to use all of it to make a decision, those kind of things. Co-construction of success criteria is one of the most useful things I've seen in terms of um, talk where the teachers use the children's ideas to, to actually make a list of what things look like, like careful observation and helping them to, it gives them an opportunity, gives the children an opportunity again, if you think about it, to clarify and to think about and to suggest those ideas about what a particular um, kind of scientific behaviour could be or um, some kind of science practice. So those are important. I also think that this looking back on, on sort of many years now of, of classroom observation that our incidental teacher noticing of um, what students are doing and then using that as an opportunity for student elaboration. I, I will remember um, a one teacher in a classroom saying, that was a really useful scientific um, way of thinking. And then she said to the class, what made me say that? Why, what was it about what Sam said? This is what he said. What made me say that that was a um, scientific way of thinking? Talk amongst yourselves and think about that, and then I want to get your ideas. So there was that opportunity, if you like, to elaborate. But first of all, they actually gave them an opportunity to think and to talk through their ideas as well. So those things are really important. And there's so many others that you know, so I don't really want to have to do um, 
you know, that's not what this is about. I really want to, to get on these some of these things. But one of the things that the people who write about this um, is helping students to um, actually join, making sure they have time to develop their ideas, that they have some time to rehearse those ideas. Some of the things um, I've seen where kids can write first before they have to um, share their ideas. And some of the drama work I've been involved in, kids um, in the Conscience Alley, you have two um, lines of students where they're trying to give advice to a person who's going to walk down the middle of this a drama convention. And they, they're, they're trying to persuade this person into a particular kind of action and thinking about reasons as to why they should. And one of the things we found really useful was just getting them to think about, well, what are some of the reasons you think? Let's just list them and then pick the one that you think is really good. And then you can just voice that one. So opportunities to develop ideas. And then there's all those talk moves about facilitating it. You've got those capability questions and talk moves and just a whole range of guiding questions to manage the talk. Um, what I really want us to think about, and, and this is just what I'm really going to leave with you, is we, we know all this stuff, but what are we actually, how do we keep track and actually check what actually happens in our classrooms? And I think, um, one of the most exciting things, I was invited to, to go down to Waimea College where Drew, one of the previous STLPs, was um, taking part in just a teacher inquiry that they decided to do themselves. Um, and just that, all they decided was that every so many weeks they would each record a 20 minute segment of one of their lessons that they felt, they thought, was going to be a really useful talk time. And they just use their phones to record it, you know, just the audio thing on your phone. And they recorded it. And then they would listen, the three of them, three teachers working together, they just agreed to make this a focus of their practice. They'd make a time and the, fortunate, the, the leadership team had allowed them sort of some re release time to, so think about this, this might be something that might be useful for you and some of your colleagues to work through to put, a, put energy into. They sit together and um, listen to those segments and analyse them together. And then there would be a, a professional discussion about, okay, so what does that mean? Uh, is that what you intended? How did that student respond? How did you get that talk going further? They just really seriously analysed the talk and thought about how it was going, whether it was what they wanted it to be. If they were doing more kinds of one talk than another. And it was it just generated absolutely fruitful discussion and improvement in practice. You know, over time, they did this inquiry into their um, actions. So that was kind of useful. So what I thought I would leave with you is that some of these frameworks, just to have a quick look at the, the, the um, websites are there. But the, there's a very, um, this one here, this CEDA analysis framework is the detailed one. It's kind of useful to look at if, you, if you're thinking, okay, we, let's think about our talk. What it helps you do is, um, if you can see the examples in the right hand column, oops, um, some of those things that, it, sorry, I've got your pictures all over where I just, where I want to look, I'm just going to move it. There we go. So it kind of tells you the codes over on this side, but gives you sort of examples of what those things are. So it just might be a useful tool for helping you think, oh, well, that's, a, that's that kind of talk that's happening. And just to group things together. So that's one kind. And then the next one is a very simple framework that you could use to think, oh, well, was I inviting elaboration or was I just making the reasoning explicit? Were they, was, were they just synthesizing ideas or it's, it just gives you some a framework that you could use to analyze your talk, which I think could be quite useful just to for a group of teachers to use and to think about in terms of what kind of talk is happening in my classroom. So am I only ever getting them to um, make their reasoning explicit? Explicit, or am I actually getting them to elaborate and build on each other's ideas and clarify or disagree with some of those ideas? So, yeah, that's basically where I thought it would be useful to finish. So, just dropping out some ideas and some things to think about as to 
really focusing and honing in on that talk that we are doing. So I hope that's useful. A little bit tedious and boring, sorry about that, but it, it's kind of about getting down to the nitty gritty of what we actually are doing. So I hope that's useful for you. Thanks very much, Dale. Um, are you open for a few questions or comments? Or I've noticed the chat's been going along quite happily. There's a fair bit of uh, comments and things there, but um, anybody got anything that they'd like to um, comment or ask Dale about? And please unmute your microphones if you wish to contribute. I can see some um, chat there talks about absolutely explicit modeling, and I think that's absolutely critical. I've been working with um, a literacy person, and yeah, if anybody's really interested in that, there's some really exciting work going on in terms of what we call semantic waves, where teachers can really be explicit and model exactly what they're meaning by a concept and then help kids to lift that back up into a more abstract concept. So yeah, modeling is really important. I agree with you. I'm going to stop talking. I've got a, um, a sort of a naive and stupid question. And the question is, um, what, if I were to come in and visit one of these classrooms where this practice is going on, what would I notice immediately about it that's different from a so-called normal classroom? I well, does somebody else want to contribute? Um, I can jump in a little bit there. I think that you would notice the depth of conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that you would notice that um, you're really start by, by developing norms like this, you are really starting to bring in your Pacific Island children and your Maori children, um, particularly the Pacific Island children who really value working together and being able to debate and discuss ideas. Okay. So is that a thing that is big in Pacifica culture? My understanding is yes. Okay. Cool. Anyone else? <laughs> Maybe the other thing you would notice is that there would be less, less of an adult voice mm. Mm. and um, more deliberate space giving, you know, um, and, and in quite a deliberate um, action to allow space and, so, you know, like time and being comfortable yeah. with times when there's not anything to say, but there's thinking happening, you know, it doesn't have to be loud and busy and endlessly going on like that, you know, mm. that comfort in silence. To think and ponder, maybe. I think. I think. I agree that, entirely. I think it's like um, many of us were brought up in an education system where we experienced uh, a continual commentary about uh, in the classroom, and there, there was very rarely quiet time or, or thinking time or especially conversation between children, you know, student to student. So, so that's a full back, back position for us to break that and to be intentional about approaching what we want in our classrooms to be different because you invariably fall back on, on what you experienced yourself. Um, well, uh, it's certainly the case for me. I have to be very mindful about just shutting up. I'm not David Attenborough giving a commentary on the whole lesson plus the way that everybody's handling the lesson. Uh, they don't want to hear this. This is not important. Yeah. I think one of the things that you might notice too is the difference in the kind of conversation. That they're, they're much more extended. Well, I notice when I'm doing the analysis of, of, of often you get what we call um, an inquiry from the teacher, a response from the student, an evaluation by the teacher, IRE, 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 all the way along. When you're getting um, 
the, the talk is different, that, that there's a much more extended line of conversation where it goes from one student and then a student picks up another idea, that, that, that there's a much more extended um, think collab um, sort of a development of the idea that's held by everybody as the conversation goes along. It's, they're not these short bursts, if you're looking at it like that too. So you're, you're talking more about a learning network rather than individualised learning. Absolutely. And collaboration to try and understand. Does that make sense? Yes. So where everybody's focused on trying to make sense of what it is that we're thinking about. It has in interesting implications for things like NCEA assessment. Yes. <laughs> because how do, you, how, do you, how do you assess your own or the individual's progress when they've been working in this sort of collaborative situation. Interesting. Well, absolutely, and I think there are implications for the way we even just um, frame assessment in terms of what we look, because it's, if you give kids every opportunity to think together and to develop a collaborative response, and you know, where does that, what does that say for the individual? Yeah. You know, where we sit them by themselves and don't let them look back at what they've, what, <laughs> yeah. Done. Yeah. Any more questions or observations before we move on to die? Everybody's very quiet. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, Dale. Um, you hang about, and if, if we have um, questions or comments at the end, you um, still be here. Thank you. Okay, Di, over to you. I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> yeah, don't don't be too hyped up. Um, <laughs> kia ora everyone. Ko mutuku turua te maunga, ko puhinui te awa, ko manukau te moana, ko kaifori te tanifa, uh, no Diane Christensen toko ingoa, um, ko kora nui te kura. So, hello everyone. And kind of nice to see many of you back online. Uh, mm -hmm. I still have really fond memories of going up to Ohakuni with many of you. Uh, was fantastic. So I hope this doesn't recap too much of what I did up there, uh, but it's a little bit of a focus on the ambitious science teaching learning that I did when I was over in New York. And the beginnings of my playing with that pedagogy back at school. And so just to recap on the pedagogy, she says, thinking, come on, screen change. <laughs> ah, slideshow, that would help. That's better. Um, so the pedagogy, the picture of it is up here. And basically the focus of it is deepening student understanding of science ideas. And that is not on stockpiling knowledge, but on drawing together ideas and examples from bodies of evidence that students gain from very deliberate um, teaching focuses that you would plan for them. Um, looking for different ways that students are showing their reasoning how they're using evidence and using language both from ourselves and listening to students' language um, to advance their explanations and models of scientific phenomenon. And so we can break that down into even smaller samples. And the, there's just a few pictures here of things I've been playing with at school. So over the last week or so, actually not over the last week, in the first week of term when we came back to school, we talked in our class about coming out of our COVID bubbles. And I just made a comment to the kids and said, oh, well, you remember our bubble festival? And they all looked at me with blank faces. And I was like, you don't remember our bubble festival? Oh my goodness. So. This was something that I used to run maybe every two or three years, and I hadn't done one for six years. So none of the kids in my class had experienced a bubble festival. And 
I have a very strong belief that a child should not leave Koranui school without a bubble festival experience because it's a heck of a lot of fun. And so <laughs> breaking down that pedagogy, you're looking at designing the instruction around a big idea of science. So the question I had for the kids is, what is a bubble? The bubble festival itself builds a huge amount of student engagement. It's tremendous fun, but there's also a lot of learning that happens. So additional to the science learning that you do, there's a lot of opportunities for development and literacy, development and numeracy, but also all those soft skills, working with each other, collaborating, and bringing in all of that talk and discussion that Dale has been talking about. So as you can see, one of the highlights was, yes, I finally got my bubble mixture correct so that we could make the big body bubbles and put everybody inside a bubble. Um, looking at the science concepts, she says, trying to go over to her notes. So the things that the kids could look at through bubbles, elasticity, surface tension, chemistry, light, geometry. But I think the biggest idea that I wanted the kids to get was that bubbles are made of layers. So they're layers of soap and water and they're encapsulating air inside the bubble. And if you can make big bubbles, then it's a balance of natural forces. You've got to make your mixture so that the bubble is stretchy, but not stretchy enough so that it rips. And you want your mixture to be able to flow evenly to make the bubble. Um, if your mixture's not right, then it will have a tendency to rip. And there's also the effect of gravity on your bubble. So slowly gravity is pulling the soap mixture down. And there was just a little pretty, pretty picture of some of the science aspects of bubbles. Um, so what we did, engaging those students in an authentic context, they have a one hour session of play. And that's the first part of the bubble festival. Class comes in and you just give them an hour and you actually teach them to blow bubbles. You teach them to blow bubbles with a straw. You teach them to blow bubbles with their hands. And it's a really important aspect. And I think it's something we forget in a lot of our science lessons. That if we don't have that experience first, we don't actually get to the science because we want to get that hands-on investigation stuff. So we want that awe, we want that wonder, we want that joy. After they had had that first session, kids came back to class and they come up with their own questions. So I have a wall full of bubble questions. So why do they pop? Why are they so colorful? Um, why can, you know, why can you make big bubbles? Um, why can you sometimes put your hand in a bubble and sometimes you can't? It went on and on. So again, you can see that once you're starting to get children to develop questions, you are beginning to build that productive talk. Uh, I've got a little video here. We had a practice with it last night. <laughs> you possibly won't be able to hear it. And so the key points of it I've just, um, it'll come up at the end of what the kids are saying, but this was them. Um, they've had their initial bubble festival experience. And then I asked them to create a model, which was just a piece of paper. What is a bubble? They did it in teams. And there was a lot of that, um, I don't know, one, one of the things I often say to myself, so Dale's given you the, um, the technical stuff for the productive talk, but I've learnt a lot of little phrases that I use, and one of the 
best ones is spray and walk away, where you have your groups of children, but as the teacher, you've got to be really active walking around those groups and listening really actively to what they're saying. And that's where the spray and walk away comes in. When you hear something, either a misconception or somebody who's coming towards a really good idea, you might just drop a couple of lines or a sentence or something. Yeah, spray it, walk away and let them build on it themselves. So we'll try this video and see how we go. Okay, so she's saying, what's a bubble? Okay, it's a soapy substance. It's transparent. It's fragile. It's rainbow and shiny. Okay, it's got different shapes. And if you pop it, it goes back into a soapy substance. So you can see that none of that is incredibly scientific yet. But there's a couple of good words in there. I was pretty pleased with transparent. And I was pretty pleased with the idea that they thought, if you pop it, it goes back into a soapy substance. So that was kind of the beginning of making our models. And for those of you that are in this STLP, I'm really sorry that you're not coming tomorrow because I was going to get you to do the next lot of work for me. Um, which is having a second session. So I did run the second session at the Bubble Festival. It relies a lot on the quality of helpers that you have. It's 10 stations and each station has specific questions that you use to prompt the kids in their thinking. That part didn't work very well, so I'm gonna go back to it tomorrow and run those sessions just with my class to see what kind of models I can get them to develop. So the picture that you've got here on the left is where you make a bubble home. So you blow a bubble on a desk that's covered in black plastic and you just observe it um, really carefully but you're trying to predict when that bubble is going to pop. Um, there's a lot of information that kids can get to inform their models from just those careful observations. Um, as I said, I'm playing with the ambitious science pedagogy, but I think over time, we're gonna get some quality models coming from the kids. Um, so as the students share their drawings and any other documentation they make of their observations, um, that's one way that they can support their ideas through argument, but using evidence from the experiments that they have um, participated in. So in a year four to six class, in the beginning, their explanations aren't always, well, they're usually not going to be scientifically accurate. The idea is that the accuracy will improve as we move through and I can create conditions for them to, um, to actually do an experiment that will support their knowledge and understanding of what's happening. So they can discard their early ideas as they continue through in their investigations. Um, just going back to, if we're linking it with capabilities, we're looking at big science ideas. There's an awful lot of literature on big science ideas. Some of that can be a little bit tricky to, to find, but we'll get there. Um, you're grounding your teaching in some kind of anchoring event. It can be a movie, it can be an experience, uh, it 
can be a reading. My job is to support, is to support that student discourse. And so another of the little things I use, and again, there's a lot that you'll find um, on the web are uh, called back, back pocket questions that I would use when I go around the groups. So if you're trying to get kids to get started on stuff, it can be, what do we think is happening here? Um, how about we start by talking about, um, then you could say, as you're wanting to press them for further information, um, when you say this, what do you mean by it? What's the evidence that you've got for that? How can you back up um, your claim? And because we do the developing mathematical inquiry communities, the kids have become very familiar with saying, I agree with you because, or I disagree with you because, but it's a framework that can be used equally as well in science as in the mathematics. Um, that's just a quick flick of how I think the capabilities fit in to the ambitious science teaching framework, and I think they fit really well. Again, using all those questioning techniques, talk is a tool for our learning, and there's a whole different variety of questions that you can use and working through those questions with the kids and they then become really familiar with them and it, they do become classroom norms. Um, so there's lots of scaffolding of talk, giving kids the opportunities to participate in making sense of the science. So yeah, the asking questions, the being confident and feeling safe enough to give an explanation, whether it's right or wrong. And that safety in the classroom is a really big thing. Um, lots of discussion on interpreting data. I think the really key thing to develop in your classroom is to build on and respect kids thinking. And you've, while, while you're doing that, you've still got to try and maintain that focus on the science ideas. Um, flicking through now into the stuff that I did when I was in the States. So purpose of a model is um, to describe, to explain, or to predict some kind of natural phenomena and to communicate your science thinking to other people. I like to have a guiding question for my teaching. And I don't know, I, I think a lot of us plan for inquiry and we would have an, an inquiry question that we were looking at. And it's really important to restate that question again and again and again, for especially for the primary kids. Um, so in the bits that I'm going to follow up with, our question was, what can maps tell us about land and water on Earth? And by, I think by restating those questions again and again, you're actually starting to plan for success for your kids. Um, this was a Smithsonian unit, so a lot of you will have um, well, we have the Hutt Science Kits. In the States, the Smithsonian put out a lot of kits as well. And there's a lot of that stuff available if you go to Smithsonian Education. So this was a unit with year three students. The assessment was focused on constructing viable arguments where they actually used evidence and they critiqued the reasoning of each other through developing their models and through talk. So this is an example of um, some of the reading that they would have done, um, or one of the initial activities that they would have done, where they had a very simple map with a very simple legend. And 
there was lots of, yeah, there were probably 10 lessons where we went through different readings about maps, about types of water, about landforms that you would find in the States and about how maps represent those landforms. Um, we used anchor charts. And so as we would run a classroom lesson, we would um, get the kids to um, identify what the key points were. And then we as teachers would record those. And all of these anchor charts were available to the children all of the time. The real advantage to that that I've found um, is that it gives you a really good basis for building your writing and for developing your scientific literacy skills. Oh, and I'll just turn off my phone. Apologies. Sorry about that. Um, the initial model that the children made. So they, in this model here, the children have identified uh, a lake, a river, a mountain, and a plain. But there's big areas there that have no land and no water. And so we had to go back, we had to go back here. We did a further reading with the children and we added, um, they had to revise their models. So we did a jigsaw reading and discussion where the children were split into groups and then they reported back in the, in the different groups for each for a different aspect. And we gave them a gotta have section on their models. So they shared their ideas and made their own design choices in their groups. There were really rich discussions and you could actually see the development of students thinking building through those discussions. So their gotta haves were that they had to have three patterns of water and three patterns of land and they had to have at least one pattern of frozen water. Now because it was in northern New York and it was winter, kids were really used to frozen lakes, snow on the ground. Um, and so it was, it was more within their understanding having the frozen water than it would have been doing that in Stokes Valley. But you can see that their final models have shown, so this one has shown um, a small lake which is here, um, islands, it's shown an ocean and a river. So that's the, and then it's got snow on the top of their mountain, a plain and the mountain here. So they've got their three patterns of land and three patterns of water. So that was considered as a successful model for what was asked of the children. For the older students, um, the models tend to be a little bit different. And so this was on endothermic and exothermic reactions. I didn't actually attend this series of lessons, but this presentation was at a conference that I was at. Um, so students have developed their models by engaging with doing these um, experiments. What they then did was they discussed and used all of those talk moves and sentence frames and they use color coded post-it notes to give peer feedback. So they could either add, and add ideas to each other's models, suggest that they remove an idea, um, revise something, or if they used a yellow post-it, it was, oh, I've still got questions about this. And so that's a really good way to actually see how the kids thinking is changing over time. And that's it from me. And the little um, website down here, there's an awful lot of information there that you can get from that. So, 
Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks, Diane. Fascinating. That was lovely. Okay, as before, any questions or feedback for Di? I have a pat eye. Hello. Hello, Susie here. Thank you so much. That was um, fantastic. Um, one of the questions I have is when you're having that, um, those, when you're starting off a new topic, a topic and you have that discourse with the students and trying to get their ideas, and obviously some students will have some quite serious misconceptions, I'm always really um, conscious that when students are willing to share, you don't want to shoot them down with what they're trying to share. And so how, I'm just curious as to what, you, what sort of things you might use to try and not do that, but at the same time encourage them to keep answering. So one of the things I say, for example, is, oh, that's an interesting idea. What do others think? So, I mean, it's completely left field and it's really not a good scientific idea, but at the same time, you don't want to stop them from sharing those ideas and you want to help develop their thinking. So any ideas on how you encourage that without completely saying that's a terrible answer? <laughs> um, so what I quite often do, sometimes I'll let those ideas run. It, it depends on how left of left field it can be. Uh, we do an awful lot in class of I agree with because or I disagree with because. And so I'll quite often say to the kids, oh, anyone, anyone agree or disagree? And as soon as somebody says, I agree, I'll put in that because. And, and often you can actually, um, I don't know, you can steer conversations a little way. Right. But then I will also be thinking in my head, if it's, if it's a big misconception that I can't address well in that lesson, I will be trying to think of, okay, what can I do in the next lesson that could address that misconception? And I have to make a note to myself and say, right, this was here. We're going to move in that direction. And then I start asking the kids for evidence. So what was your evidence for that idea once they've maybe done another experiment that would give them some, uh, give them more of an idea on what we're trying to get to? Yeah, it's yeah, it's a tricky one. It's it's not it's um but yeah, I like that idea just sitting on it and then trying to come back to it later. Yeah, and, and you have you have you have to come back to it because you can't you Yeah, can't no, you can't just no, you can't let it hang no. No. no um but I I know especially with some of my kids who suddenly a child has said something, you go, oh my God, that's the first time they've said something in the first two weeks mm. of school. I'm not going to shoot that one down. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you also use their peers to try and bring them in. And um, you might say to another child, oh, you've got this idea. Can you explain this idea? And tell me why you think that. So what's your evidence for that idea? So you're actually getting the rest of the class to um, give their ideas and you're hoping to bring that other child along. So you might bring them in a bit later on and say, oh, what did you think of, you know, Susie's idea? You yeah. know? I think it might be about generating a range of alternatives too. Yeah. That you actually you don't want to, you absolutely don't want to not value what the children bring. Yeah. That's the way they've understood the world. <laughs> that, that is their understanding. So we have to give value to that and somehow build on it. So I think what Dyer is talking about exactly is that it's about generating a range of alternatives, which sometimes you can then just put out there, disassociate them from the child by just, I mean, sometimes you can do that with concept cartoons, you know, you can just say, well, let's just think about these ideas. You can rephrase it so it doesn't look exactly like the, the actual child's idea, but, you know, it's, you remove that idea from the child, but then they become ideas for consideration with evidence and um, take it from there with your investigations. And I think like Di says, you really then have to challenge, well, how would we, how are we going to actually gather some evidence to help them rethink or mm. rethink? this idea yeah and maybe just as well just saying gosh I don't know um 
let's figure out a way that we can test that idea that you've got. And mm. I, I find, because mm. we've got, you know, a significant number of Māori and Pacifica children, and Pacifica children especially are very reticent initially to actually put their ideas forward. So, and, and when they do, and often when our Māori children do, there's an aspect of mataronga in there. I'm not ever going to shoot that down. I no. mean, I, I'm the learner there. And so I have to increase my um, learning and ability to kind of try and incorporate cultural ideas as well as scientific ideas. Mm, yeah, thank you. I think sometimes, uh, you know, there's a real time when it's really important to just generate those ideas, isn't there, you know, and you're just kind of taking all other ideas. And then there's other times where you're really trying to challenge it, it just kind of bring things together, you know. So there's sometimes when you can say, well, how does that add to our thinking? What have we, you know, you can kind of, yeah, there are some times when it's almost good just to say, oh, that's great, and <laughs> move <laughs> on. <laughs> Thanks for that. Let's think about that later. <laughs> it's about knowing how you're going to respond and how important it is at the time, because sometimes you could just spend an awful lot of time at the beginning and never get away from anything, eh? never get anything underway. I think those concept co cartoons are a really good idea, Dale, because mm. you can present different ideas and then ask for evidence to support each idea. And doing something to challenge some of those ideas, giving them some evidence to think with. Yeah. What sort of, um, I don't know how to express this. How does the um, person's, how much does the person's emotional attachment to their ideas get in the way of them accepting a changed worldview or a changed idea? I mean, how, how resistant a, 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 a of people to change in the, in the um, uh, when they're faced with evidence when it doesn't when when they when they have an emotional attachment to stuff. I'm thinking about um, maybe someone like Donald Trump. Mm. Luckily, I don't teach him. <laughs> You're very lucky. <laughs> um, I think does that relate? partly to, um, sorry Di, um, but does that re relate partly to actually modelling and giving the children t experiences and using evidence as a tool for thinking about things in the world and so they might not change their ideas and their misconceptions for the first few times, but as they get better at understanding the role of evidence, then they'll become more critical thinkers and being able to reflect. And so the, the emotional attachment will become more of a cognitive process about rationalizing some of their ideas. Because yeah. there's research that shows that the students don't like to change their ideas at all. Um, you can sometimes teach them to say a new trick as regards a re what you want in a test or something like say NCEA for an exam but they'll leave and still believe what they thought in the first place. I think that is another complicating issue too and, and particularly with younger children is that um, they don't apply the same reasoning or transfer the logic of their ideas from something to another. You know, they can have a, a, a they can hold on to one idea or, or, or be, or develop a logical understanding for something, but they will have a, a different explanation for something else. And so as well as holding on to ideas, they don't have a logical kind of way of 
having to think about everything in the same way. You know, if this happens here, they won't necessarily use that same logic to say, oh, well, that happened there, therefore that could explain this. They can hold on to other wacky explanations for other things that the same idea would have explained. But I haven't, I haven't explained that very well, but their, their reasoning is often not logical too. So that's another feature of holding on to ideas, but then not transferring them to other situations either. So yeah, it, it's not easy what we're talking about. No, but it's a 13 year journey as well. Yeah, exactly. And, and we've got to look at it as that. It's like, I, I'm not going to create genius scientists in the, in the three years <laughs> that I have them. Um, but the, the hope is that they will be more skillful by the time they leave, leave my class than when they came into my class and that they will have some of those skills that they can transfer. Yeah. And my I was experience just... is more than a 13-year journey. Um, <laughs> personally, it's a 76-year journey. <laughs> it's true. And counting. And counting. Well, yes, I hope we have a few more left. <laughs> I was just thinking too that um, in answer to your question um, is that is an element of as teachers we've got to model that acceptance of other people's opinions and changing things so that students will accept that it's okay for them to change their mind as well if we're open to that then that gives them the the okay to to change their thinking as well and backing it up with evidence obviously but if, if we're going to shoot things, you know, if we're going to say, oh, this is how it is, then they're always going to have that narrow framework, or narrow sort of thinking. Mm. But um, as long as we allow that process of thinking and changing your mind to happen and model it, then it, it should allow them to think that way too. That's interesting from the point of view of what uh, people have commented about um, scientific opinion and theories about the COVID thing because the uh, ideas like for example about face masks have changed and so mm. there have been you know comments that well scientists don't know what they're talking about because they've changed their minds yeah and that's because how, people how are do not don't realize that? it's the process of science because the that's evidence right. is the evidence now because they've had more data to back up that actually yes it's proven that using face masks now face masks does actually help prevent the spread but mm. people don't seem to be aware of that process of science is an evolving thing. It's not just a, this is a one answer here and it's always going to be that way. That's right. Interesting. Mm. Mm. Anybody else want to come in on this? We've been a bit hogging it. <laughs> Donna and Georgia, are you um, wanting to comment or? I think Who else? Oh, here's Don, or just Donna. Oh, I've just been um, talking just briefly with um, Di in the background there, just um, how fantastic the bubble unit and such is. But um, I agree also with uh, Susie in terms of We've talked earlier today, Susie, just about being that, run, you know, modelling that vulnerability, which is hugely important, mm -hmm. and not only in a leadership role, just, just as a learner as well. So, yeah, yeah. It's um, hugely important overall throughout life. Yeah. And if we can model that and that our ideas evolve and change and that it's okay, that, um, yeah, I think... I think that's totally acceptable of our kids and as you're saying in the media as well what the media is portraying about our scientists mm, in terms of our face masks so. yeah Hi, Hi, it's, oh, Sharon, Sharon, I haven't, oh yeah oh, yeah sorry oh. hello Sharon here um Di um would you um do you think having an inquiry model that runs through the school is really important for encouraging this ambitious science talk? Or does that make it easier, maybe? If there's already an inquiry model that you can kind of link into? I think it probably does. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I, 
I can't say that I've actually thought of it in that way, but yeah, I think it would do. Okay. And I think Thank it would build into an inquiry um, model. Cool. Thank you. And the other question I was going to ask was that um, obviously the um, the idea of what can maps tell us about land and water on Earth was the big question. So is that the big question, obviously, in the American in the curriculum that they were using in that state? Is that um, where that question came from, or is that like a student led question, or do you no, know? That, no, that wasn't a student led question. That was that was. Um, so we were actually trialling um, that science kit for um, Smithsonian. Oh, perfect. Okay. That was yep, the cool. question that the Smithsonian educators had come up with. And I kind of looked at it and I thought, oh, I've never, ever taught geomorphology with year threes. I wonder how the heck this will work. Um, and it worked. And, and I mean, the models were Play-Doh. And we had yes. to think about it really hard. And we were like, oh, okay. Because they'd looked at all sorts of fantastic maps. And so we kind of went, all right, no, we're going to limit it. Three colours of Play-Doh, white, blue, and green. <laughs> um, but it, it did. It, it, was, it was a really successful unit, actually. Um, and, yeah, the kids, the kids got a lot, both in terms of what would be our maths curriculum, but also in terms of, yeah, literacy and science. And it sounds silly, but those anchor charts, I'd always kind of looked on American websites and gone, oh, what's an anchor chart? But they had them, they have these great big, well, I think Jen probably has them, those great big sticky pieces of um, kind of A1 or A2 paper. Mm -hmm. And they just slam those up all over their walls. And they, they're absolutely fabulous for... Um, writing development because you've got all of your vocab up there you've got all of your technical terms um, and the kids can just yeah refer back to them all the time i i like them die because they really keep track of where the thinking of the class is at yeah yeah they do yeah i i use them i just use them every time i do an inquiry with my teaching students now we just keep yeah i just i, I just yeah, I find them really invaluable for just keeping track of where we're at, everybody's ideas, what evidence we've got. Really useful. Yeah. yeah. And the other one that was really useful was that use of sticky notes with the colour-coded sticky notes. Mm -hmm. That was amazing. It was so simple. And and the kids were, I mean, they, those were secondary kids, but they were very focused on oh, no, okay, this, this is a question, or I, 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 have you thought about this idea? It, it was a, and it gave you such a clear image of the changes in thinking, because after that feedback from their peers, the children would then review their own models, and in the end, um, you would come up with a class consensus model. Okay, how are we doing, folks? Are we pretty well there? Mm. We think. Anybody fabulous. else got any any um, final shares or comments before we wind up? Anybody who hasn't um, spoken, who has a burning need to contribute? Okay, well. Thank you very much, you two. I've, I've learned a lot today, so that's great. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody else, for coming along. And um, I will post this on the um, YouTube channel when it has duly been sort of um, downloaded and sorted out and, um, yeah, put up on there. But anyway, please, everybody, look after yourselves. Um, most people, I guess, are at um, level two. But if anybody is here tonight who's on level three, you know, my thoughts are with you. And, uh, yeah, God bless. Okay? And uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Diane and um, Dale. Cheers. Well, thanks, everyone. Nice to see you all. Great to see you. Thank you, Di. Thank yep. you, Dale. Come visit any time. <laughs> Thanks, Dale. Thanks, Di. Appreciate that. All righty. Bye-bye. Thanks for coming. See ya. Oh, Hayden, can you stick around for a second? 
I have a party for you, Hayden, if you're still there. Can you hear I'll me, Hayden? For a bit, because I don't want to. Um, oh yeah, break up the meeting. Pull the, pull the plug on it. So I'll I'll um, just turn my. Oh no, that, yeah, that's fine. Hayden, can you hear me? Hepatai Taku. Hayden, you'll need to unmute your um, microphone. I'll un I'll unmute it. Oh, thank or you. I'll ask you if I can unmute it for you. He might ah. have stepped out of the room or something. He might not even. Are you there, Hayden? Never mind, Michael. I shall ask him in the morning. All right. Okay. It's all good. Hey, thank you so much. All right. You look after tonight yourself. Tonight for organising. You too. See you when you get home. Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds right. very good. We'll have a cup of coffee when we can have cups of coffee. Well, we can still have cups of coffee. We can have cups of coffee. All right. Let's, let's have something even stiffer. Yes. Sounds yes, good. A cup of, a cup of frozen coffee. Aha. <laughs> Yahaha. Okay. okay. Night, night. Thanks, Bye -bye. Michael. Bye.